that and plenty more in the next half hour. First, let's meet the two politicians who will be with me for the whole of today's programme. Gillian Keegan is the Conservative MP for Chichester. Welcome to the programme. Thank you. And Gerald Vernon Jackson is the Liberal Democrat leader of Portsmouth City Council, uh, who have been knocking on the head the energy scheme, which was supposed to be providing cheap energy for everyone in Portsmouth and spending taxpayers' money on doing it as well. Yep. Why? Because actually it wasn't going to produce cheap energy. It, the business plan was based on not being the cheapest. And actually the original business plan was about selling energy to people in fuel poverty at much higher cost than they could have got elsewhere. And, and a whole lot of reasons for saying no to it. But this was up risking millions of pounds of taxpayers' money. And we just can't do that. It was, it was the worry about how it would turn out. But you've got a professional report done yes. on it. Yep. Which Price House, Price Waterhouse Coopers said you needed 144,000 people to sign up to it, is yes, that right? Yes, so it needed, so. it needed 44,000 people to sign up each and every year just mm -hmm. to hit break even. Hmm. And, and that's a lot of people to get to join an energy company. But, but it sounds like the sort of thing that councils ought to be doing? Or do you know much about this particular I, I mean, idea? this particular bit, not, not so, so much. Mm. And I know that at a national level, we have obviously introduced the, the price cap now. So maybe that's made a, a difference to some of these schemes. Mm. You know, we're not really in favour of, of, of nationalisation at a national level. However, there, is been, there has been quite a lot of innovative schemes mm. um, where people are looking at whether they can provide energy innovative locally. And in some cases, that works. I mean, what about making a profit for the council, which this one was intended to do before you decided it probably wouldn't? You know, it calls into question one big, big uh, pillar of Labour's policy, which is if you can't get it working in, a, in an area like, like Portsmouth, then mm. is this nationalisation kind of schemes? Uh, it are, they, are they really a Labour um, policy? This was a Conservative no, idea. No, I mean in terms of nationalising energy companies. Okay. I'm talking at a national level. So yeah. it, it just calls into question. I, 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 I mean, I would be interested in looking mm. more, more because I know um, Donna Jones is fantastic. She knows her way around a business case. She's a businesswoman, so she really will have done this with, you know, with the, with the slide rule put over it. What's yeah. happened between now and then, obviously some things can change. I don't know what's Happens, said it could make 22 million pounds in 10 years uh, mm. and yet and that, and I think that was the official report as yeah. well uh, and yet you're now going to be spending taxpayers money and getting rid of the it the contract that I was sent said that the council would have to lend this company up to 11.9 million pounds of taxpayers money and that money is at risk mm. and my question is what level of risk actually doing things like this if they're going to bring in money is great because it protects services from government so cuts. will you keep the other investments yes that probably have had and we will years. look at other things that we will do that we'll do yeah. but I want to make sure that we do them which risks less taxpayers money because yeah. if we lost 11.9 million pounds of taxpayers money people would rightly be furious Okay. And we've got to make sure there's a proper well, business case. I think, I think risk, you, you, you probably have a, a lower appetite for risk, perhaps, because actually what a lot of councils are doing, and they're doing it differently, mm. is they are becoming more commercial to try and have other s streams of revenue. They can't all do it, though, can they? Uh, well, they can't they'll all do it well. with each other. Um, no, not to necessarily. own businesses and all the rest of it. They're not normally competing with each other. They're normally com competing with somebody else in the commercial sector, so okay. in terms of property. So, you know, Chichester, for example, we are the land landlords for all the big um, sites, you know, like all, all the big shops, mm. we're the landlords for that. So we're not competing with other councils. But you're borrowing money as a yep. public institution for, yep. at a cheap mm. rate because of the Public Works Loan Board. That, that's not real competition for the commercial people who know um, what they're doing. Uh, well, I mean, that, there, there is a different playing field there, which is why mm. it's, why it's uh, interesting for councils. But actually, we're not borrowing money in that case because that's not, okay. not, not the model but, for, for Chichester. But, but, but you're right. It, they, there is something about lower government borrowing and if it can be used in, in you've got to have your appetite yep. for risk tested and it will be different across mm. the country and it's right to test that risk okay. but you do need That's to get it right but you may just have a lower uh, appetite uh, and, for but risk. I think we well, but, but for instance the Portsmouth runs and built the port and we bought a fruit importing business. Mm -hmm. Those are fairly risky things, but they bring in yep. profits of millions of pounds every year. But it's just the level. Well, they, they do that now, but they somebody, do somebody at some point will have made Absolutely. that decision okay, when yes. they didn't have that certainty. We've got lots to get through. Yep. Thank you. In the last 10 years, almost a quarter of Britain's pubs have closed their doors, according to new figures from the ONS released this week. As well as the economic impact that has, pubs are often a vital element, bringing their local community together. Joining me now is Matt Todd, landlord of the Wanston Arms, just outside Winchester, uh, which is special, partly, 
because it's community run, mm. but also because you've been nominated for Canberra's Pub of the Year Award. Um, that must have been a great feeling in a pub that uh, has been kept going by the community. Oh, it was a great piece of news. The yeah. locals just are so excited. Yeah, just a real great story. And, and you were telling me earlier that at the time you pulled the first pint, you didn't actually know how to do it. So yeah, I had to I show you how to operate the pump. <laughs> That's true. I bought a pub because I wanted to save it. And I believed in that village pub. I'd used it as a customer. Um, it had fallen into sad times. And um, I just believed it could happen. The fact that I couldn't um, pull a pint was <laughs> not really important. Uh, the customer showed me to do that. And where so many pubs um, serve food and make money from food, uh, you, you have visits from takeaway vans occasionally, or yeah, fish and chips food. or something. Yes, yeah, we pop don't up do food. food. Yeah, oh, pop that up sounds food. much so sexier. Than local local businesses van. that do uh, yeah. a pop up fish and chip van comes on a Tuesday night, yeah. and then we use the Indian restaurants in Winchester to deliver curries on a Friday night. Okay. So, But in general, you, you say you, you want to get the sort of atmosphere where people aren't just hunched over their plates and eating but where they're chatting to each other. That's exactly right. I have this phrase in my head, if you go out to eat, you never meet anybody. So we've uh -huh. taken the food away and people come in and mix and chat. Everyone gets said hello to and everybody says goodbye. So, I mean, there's been legislation around this um, and I suppose there's, there, there maybe some people would say there should be some sort of action against the big brewing companies and the way they've operated with tied houses and what have you. But would you say that uh, actually keep government and councils out of this just let the community get together behind something i would say that i uh, my pub is a free house so yeah. we're not tied to any brewery um and i own the pub and the community have brought into the idea of uh, running it as a community business so mm. so they're the guys that make it work they are our spokespeople they're the word of mouth they bring people in and yes if it gets busy which it does sometimes some of the community come behind the bar and help me mm. Gillian, it might just be that he's good at running a pub and he, he could have run it whatever. But, I mean, it, it, it was on its last leg, supposedly. Yeah. And there's, how can we encourage communities to use it or lose it with all sorts of different things? Well, services? I think, you, you know, you, you always realise what you've got when you're about to lose it or mm. if you've lost it. And I, this has happened in a number of villages of, across West Sussex as well, in my constituency, where pubs have been closed or about to be closed and suddenly the community, who haven't been using it that much, suddenly realise that it, it, mm. it is the heart of the community. It's the only real thing that everybody sort of coalesces around around in many cases a community shock can also be the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. same feeling um, so I think I think it's brilliant what you're doing and actually what you're doing as well as having the community involvement is things like pop-up food as well that could be an innovative way because actually the cost of investing in the sort of kitchens that you need to be able to do the sort mm -hmm. of food that people want is quite expensive so maybe that's another model and people have to you know mm. kind of move with the times there's also micro breweries they're exploding actually we just opened a couple in Chichester with these an exploding brewery but mm. well, anyway in uh, terms of numbers uh, they're doing uh, there, very are, well, there is there is a, a, a you know more and more of them I, I've just went to a new one that opened last week um, because people are cha changing they want craft beers and um, and there's gins the gin bars so there's different things and you have to go with uh, you know where, where the people are, are wanting how they're wanting to enjoy themselves and is that the problem is it that things aren't keeping up with what's needed for the future i mean there's coffee shops everywhere coffee shops everywhere but i think the basic problem was an unintended consequence of the break between um pubs and being owned by breweries who made beer when mm. so so whitbread Mm. Don't don't do don't are not in the pub chains anymore. They've walked away, mm. uh, and so lots of the pubs have been bought by people who just think of them about as properties, and they're just out there to make money. And the way in which they can make money is normally shutting the pub and turning it into housing, and that's been a real problem because there's no the people who own it have no interest in running it. These big companies. I'm, I'm fighting with one uh, in the uh, in Portsmouth at the moment mm. who want to throw out. Uh, a tenant who's run a decent bar and restaurant for years mm. and yet they want to throw them out because they're not interested in community they're just interested in making a quick buck so do you think legislation in that situation might be useful or, or just empowering people like you to do it or do you think no it's it's just telling the community and I think the legislation is important uh, there mm. there are mechanics to allow yeah. the community to uh, to mm. to make the the, uh, the pub an asset and that gives them time to be able to put a bid together to buy the pub themselves mm. and once even the asset ownership is within the village they've got skin in the game yeah. Yeah. and they can then run it as a business because sometimes as because you say you don't realize yeah. what you've got until but these are businesses and yeah. they need to be run professionally be run as a business as, thanks for coming in and talking about it good luck with the award thank you
Now, still to come on today's show, regenerating our coastal communities is the answer to pump money into heritage sites and local landmarks that are in need of a bit of TLC. According to the government, it's going to form part of the Brain Belt, a transport corridor to link the two university cities of Oxford and Cambridge. And along the way, it's supposed to give a boost to the region's high-tech industries, as well as help solve the housing shortage by creating up to a million new homes. But as our Oxfordshire reporter Beth and Nimmo has been finding out, the so-called Varsity Expressway is a bit more no way. Your back's against the world. Camping out in trees, digging tunnels under the ground, just some of the tactics adopted by protesters in a desperate battle to stop the Newbury Bypass being built. 22 years on, plans for the new Oxford to Cambridge Expressway and a new generation of eco-warriors to go with it. So we're not deliberately breaking the law, but if in fact that it came to that, all of us are prepared for that. I promised my mum my mom, I wouldn't get arrested until after A-levels, but once A-levels are done, I definitely would be, yeah. <laughs> Last week, the group Extinction Rebellion brought traffic in Oxford to a standstill in protest against the expressway, and they promised more acts of civil disobedience if they aren't listened to. This week, more protests. Opposition to the new road is growing. I think there's a real sense of building a campaign at the state, at the early stage, which is so important. We've got an awful lot of people behind this now. A lot of councillors and MPs who were trying to brush this under the table are now realising they will have to take this quite seriously. There's a sense that campaigns have stepped up a notch since the government announced the broad corridor the road will take up to Oxford. It will roughly follow the route of East West Rail and the village of Wendelbury sits right in its path. With a million houses set to be built on the route, there are real fears this rural community will be swallowed up by development. Our worry is that Bristol will just continue to expand. They could expand in this direction and, uh, and in all the other rural communities around it. People come here to get away from urbanisation in Bicester. My next door neighbour came from Bicester. Last year, another neighbour came from Bicester with their small family because they see a rural environment is a much safer, you know, safer place to bring people up in. When plans reach what was this week the rather wet and windy county of Oxfordshire, the route for the expressway remains vague. Here where the A34 and M40 branch off in different directions near Bicester is roughly where planners have to make a major decision. The new expressway could go round to the west of Oxford following the route of the A34. That could potentially mean upgrading the current road. But if you widen the carriageway at Botley, that means demolishing houses. The other option is to go to the east of Oxford along the M40's route and then cut across to the A34. But campaigners say that means concreting over countryside. So it's clear whichever route planners choose, there's going to be major opposition. The fact is, no one really wants a new road in their backyard. Wherever the expressway is built, it's feared that wildlife could suffer. Dry Sandford Pit is home to rare species that could be threatened if the road goes close by. If the expressway comes really close to this area, it could really impact the air quality. There'll be loads more recreational impacts on sites like this. That's just going to really put too much pressure on wildlife. 56% of our species are in decline in this country. And even across our three counties, there's a huge amount of pressure from development, um, from things like climate change, from the impact of agricultural practices. Um, and we really need to rethink the way in which we approach these things. But while there are plenty of critics, the government says the expressway will cut journey times and mean much needed homes and jobs. Plus, it's promised that the road would ease pressure on the congested A34. That's a name supported by County Council leader Ian Hudsbeth. Does he think others will back it too? Absolutely. There's 680,000 residents in Oxfordshire and the A34 impacts on all of them across the five councils, across the six constituencies, and so we've got to make sure we improve it so we get better for business and we're not held up as we see on a daily basis. This is an opportunity to get the A34 sorted and we have to take it. But like Swampy and the rest of the Newbury Bypass protesters, campaigners here say they won't give up without a fight. They're just not sure yet if that will mean camping out in the trees.
I personally wouldn't. I've got arthritis and I don't think I could. But the feelings are so strong that it, it, it provokes that sort of action. I think I'm a feeble protester. <laughs> and I don't like the cold. <laughs> Someone will step up to be the uh, Oxfordshire Swampy, I'm sure, maybe once the A-levels are over, as they were <laughs> suggesting there. Um, will they have democratic right on their side to oppose this sort of thing? I mean, you, you know, is it NIMBYism, or is it, and is it people living nearby, or is it, you know, that we sh they're saying they've not been properly consulted? I, I think all of the above. The first thing mm. is, do they have democratic right to, to protest? Mm. Of course, absolutely. Mm. I mean, that, that, that's part of... Mm. Uh, of, of our democracy. Um, are they NIMBYs? We all are NIMBYs. I, I say to everybody, you know, I've got a field behind my house. If there was a whole load mm. of houses built on it, I would not be happy. I will be honest. So, you know, there is an element of we all have, you know, something to... We love our own community. Isn't so it a bit like Brexit? If you're going to oppose it, you've got to suggest something else yes, nowadays. Yes, you have. And, and, and actually, th that's absolutely right, because we do have to get the balance. We're investing a lot. We need to invest in some of the... So this has obviously got a lot of jobs attached to it as well. Mm. And they're very high-quality jobs. Mm. We need to invest in those jobs for the future post-Brexit. And we know we have got a massive housing problem. We've got a lot of people who are homeless we see on the street, but also temporary homeless. And until we build more homes, we're not going to get over that. And I say to everybody I meet, you probably could not afford the house that you live in today based on your salary if I index linked it. Mm. The house prices has got away from normal families. Um, all of us, would uh, yeah. our houses have been more successful than we have. So That's it's got to reality. go somewhere and they've just got to lump it? Um, it's got, uh, it's a, I, don't, I don't say that because they do have to be in consultation and I, I think the MPs are also yeah. not um, all in favour oh, of this as well. There's a lot gone into Bista as well. And, and I think we also have to think that it seems to me that most of the time the government and civil servants are addicted to roads and there must be other ways of well, getting people around. A, a railway line yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, 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 but so yeah. from Portsmouth to London, average speed on the railway, 45 miles an hour. The trains go slower now than in the Victorian era because right. of failure to invest. If we're going to give people real alternatives to going on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the car, then you have to invest. Southampton to Portsmouth on the railway takes forever. But, but also technology is moving investment. on. It is moving on. You know, maybe in 50 years' time we, we won't even get, need cars. We might be up to 46 <laughs> miles an hour average, <laughs> average speed on the railway. Uh, okay. Or using different technology, indeed. Right, but let's just look at this expressway situation because you did the Newbury bypass. I did. Did yep. you actually open it? I did. Telling me. When I was mayor of Newbury, um, they had to smuggle us in, yeah. um, so we didn't get surrounded by protesters. And, and the predictions there from the protesters was yeah. that within 10 years, the whole thing would be gridlocked, and it's not happened. And what, what the Newbury Bypass did was to give the town of Newbury back to its residents so mm. they didn't have a huge queue of lorries chucking out fumes stuck in the middle of their town every day, all day. But the fear uh, is that it's not going to be properly consulted but also not properly designed. Milton Keynes, you know, was well designed but it's still growing. It's very difficult to yeah. get this all in the right order, isn't it? It is, and, but I think you have to take the local community with you. We know mm. that uh, very well in Chichester because we've had our own um, you mm. know, failed consultation on an, a on an A27 route, which hopefully um, we, we'll, we'll be getting to again. And actually, if they don't want the money, we'll probably uh, could do oh, well, some of it in Chichester. Let's just take, let's uh, just take that. Yeah, I completely then. support yeah. you, Julian. Yeah. Let, let's leave it there. Uh, now, the rundown seaside town is a bit of a cliche, I suppose, but true in many ways. Maybe Maybe faded, faded glory would be a kinder phrase than run down. But this week, several seaside towns in the south have had a bit of a boost from the Coastal Revival Fund, getting up to £50,000 each to spruce up or bring back into operation heritage buildings and landmarks that have needed a bit of TLC. There's a list of who got what there at the bottom of the screen. And here with more is Dr Andy Brown, who's the, uh, the Planning and Conservation Director for English Heritage. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Um, I'd have thought all these things have been done by now. Are they just mm. needing more work? Yeah, or? There's a very long list of things that need to yeah. be fixed still. Um, but it's, uh, it's great that this, um, this, this is new money, extra money, so it's great that the, that the government's announced this, uh, this, these, uh, these winners. £50,000 doesn't go a very long way, but it's, but it's all really mm. important and helpful stuff. Can I be a bit devil's advocate with you and say a lot of the things you're trying to save here were built at the heyday of seaside towns mm -hmm. when they were successful because there was a strong economy. Don't you need to really solve the problem by 
finding new uses for seaside towns that will provide the money for future. Absolutely, and that's where the heritage assets actually become really important. You're making of that. them for tourists? Yeah, no, no for, for the local communities as well. The, if, you, if you can invest and make people proud of the place that they live in, that lifts the whole place. That's not just for tourists, that's for people who live there mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and want to be proud of their place again. Is the basic problem, though, that they're at the end of the railway line, they're at the end of the road, you know, that, that uh, it's people sort of end up in seaside towns rather than them being centres of economic development. It's always a problem in a seaside town that you've only got half of the, the sort of um, the catchment area that you would normally be Yeah, able the high to, street uh, is the promenade, yeah, and, yes. and you can only go yeah. one way out. Exactly, that's it, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, that's a challenge. We must rise to it and, and make the most of it. That mm. promenade that used to be such a, such a busy and vibrant part is, has become a bit sort of bedraggled and forlorn. Mm. Uh, and a little bit of money like they've just been announcing mm -hmm. to invest in the promenades, make them a place where people want to be again. And that's, that's going to get footfall for those shops in the, along the, the, uh, the seafront as well. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's all part of the solution. Uh, is it being spread a little bit thin because everybody says oh we need some for our pier or we need some for our shelters Weymouth got some for the shelters there mm -hmm. but but could you just concentrate on some places make them work has everybody's got a, a part to play in this so mm -hmm. um, these relatively small amounts of money are great for for building the momentum and getting people involved in in projects giving people an opportunity to get involved in, and do stuff but then the real money is often from um, colleagues and partners like the heritage lottery fund who come in with the uh, with the serious money to do the big transformational jobs. Mm. Uh, d building all these things together, but it's also having the vision, isn't it? Uh, Gerald in Portsmouth. So, so we're having to replace the whole of the promenade. Yeah. Um, 100 million pound project. We're about 20 million pounds short. So very happy if Andy's going to write us a check. Um, oh, yes. He's <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, going to give it all to Portsmouth. But, but, it, but it's, you have to balance the, the sea defences with rising sea level and the storms getting bigger. We're trying to make sure that it's a wonderful and vibrant place for people to come to and walk along the seafront, come to the events like Victoria's happening on South Sea Common. Uh, and I'm very, un very disappointed that Andy turned down our bid for money to bring the South Sea Lighthouse back into operation. <gasps> no! It's, uh, it's terrible, Andy, isn't it? Why do we need a lighthouse? Do we need a lighthouse? Um, well, we do, but luckily I'm pleased to say that it's not us who's actually turned down the money. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. All right. Um, no, we'd be delighted to help. We've invested heavily in Portsmouth, yes. and particularly in the fantastic work that's been done in the dockyard yes. in yes. Portsmouth. It's, uh, it's just an amazing place to be now. Everywhere has to be a destination location now, doesn't it, to bring in the visitors. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what pays for the renovation, I suppose. Well, it does, but actually I think... I think, as Andy said, it, mm. it, it also helps local communities. Everyone wants to feel proud of mm. where they lived. And there's nothing where they live, and there's nothing worse than seeing a, a lovely seaside place where you can see the grandeur of the beautiful buildings and they just look a bit tatty. Mm. It, it, it's awful. In fact, I was driving along um, Hastings the other day mm. and I was so delighted because it's had a, a real makeover mm. and it was, it was fantastic actually. To, I, mm. I, you know, I was happy in the car mm. driving along thinking, this looks great. And actually, I think it was Thomas Cook's you know, terrible profit results were, mm. were as a result of more people staying in this country last year because mm. we had good weather. Mm. So um, actually, I think heading to the seaside and obviously we've got some wonderful coastline in Chichester as well which mm. I love going to it's my, one of my favorite parts of the day when I can you know be, be, be it, it's good for our well-being as well yeah. for everybody's well-being and it can, it's getting trendy in some ways mm. isn't it I mean, absolutely yes yeah. and Margate 10 years ago was was the butt of everybody's jokes it was. it's now a glorious place and yeah. people are really excited about what's and happening in Margate and that can that's happen that's art as well isn't it, it? it's, 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 Tracy yes. it's, all, it's all culture we're, we're all in the yeah. same game we're trying to help people um, have, a, have really enjoy these places and, and give them a real boost and, okay. and in fact in the, in the long term we'll see that everybody going off to Spain for their holidays was a blip and actually yeah. people will come back to seasides. And well there may really be other reasons why they don't go to Spain mm. but we're not going into that still <laughs> today. Don't mention it. Now our regular roundup of the political week in the south in 60 seconds. <laughs> There's a little piece of Oxfordshire on Mars. Temperature sensors on NASA's InSight Pro will tell scientists more about the planets. How they form, how they evolve, how they change. Meanwhile, outer space is coming to Didcot after the sale of a former printing plant to Rebellion Studios who make Judge Dredd. Local MP Ed Vase is delighted. The British film industry is now the most successful it has ever been. There's a campaign to remember the story of the first female MP to sit in the House of Commons. Nancy Astor should have a statue, according to Basingstoke MP Maria Miller. 
the artwork in the House of Commons is overwhelmingly of white men because that is the group of people who've dominated this place. Dorset MP Sir Christopher Choke was again accused of sexism after shouting object to a bill against female genital mutilation. He says his protest is actually against the private members bill system. Surely it's important in our democracy that we don't make laws without them properly being discussed. Gillian Keegan, what do you think of Sir Christopher Chope's objections? I, I actually attended my first Friday private member bill last Friday, um, and it's awful to watch, actually. It's a, it seems like a complete waste of time. His point is a technical point, which is this system shouldn't exist. So he mm. objects to everything. He doesn't even look at what it is. So he's Why not objecting to the detail. <laughs> because of the PPS rule, I have to go once every, every okay, third you're Friday. On the rotor, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, so that's why. Um, but it's the first time since, since being yeah, elected. Yeah. But I do, um, but I think it's a shame because there were some really good bills there. I moved the modern slavery bill um, whilst I was, you know, there's some really good bills there. What he's basically saying is they should all be done on government time. As we know, government time is limited, particularly with other things that are going on in government yeah. time. So I'm not an expert on the Constitution, he is, um, but um, the optics of it look awful. They look awful. Because I was going to say, you must like have just groaned at that again. moment he objected to yeah, something it's like on upskirting. FGM. It's exactly yeah. like upskirting, exactly the same thing. Can't you thing. have a word? I'll try. Yes. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> You're in favour of private members' bills. I think they're good. Personally, I think he's got a point. There should be government time to do it. But this working the system we've got at the moment, to have an elderly white man standing up and saying, we won't have action on female genital mutilation, having an action, saying there will be no action on... On people taking photographs. Yeah, of but these skirts. things are private no, members' bills. Yeah, they weren't but, going to but happen. No, they, they really, should were happen they? then. But he but finds oh. a way of killing good things. There would yeah. be no, there would be no legal abortion in this country for women if there had not been a private members' bill but, brought in by David Steele from the Liberal Party. But there have been hundreds, Party. probably thousands, and, of private members' bills but, that don't become law, but unless the government takes them on yeah. since then. But but if Christopher Chope had had his way, people would still be having backstreet abortions now because he doesn't like a technicality. And that's not good enough. Right. It's, he's going to be on the programme, actually, next week. Well, I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll give you the technicalities. <laughs> I'm sure, but also we will remind him of the optics. As the you optics put it. are yes. awful, the very okay. much so. And y yeah. as you say, there has been some good That's, things come out yeah. of private members' bills. So, okay. you know, they're a, they're a useful instrument at times, but he okay. makes them yeah. redundant. That's all from us for this week. Thank you to my guests, Gillian Keegan, Gerald Bernard Jackson. That's all from us. Goodbye. Yeah.